Remember Flash, that free browser plugin? In November 1996, Macromedia unleashed it upon the world. Then Adobe acquired it, keeping the thing alive with critical patch after critical patch. In November 2011, after Apple refused to allow Flash on iOS, Adobe announced the end of support for mobile. Yet it wasn't until January 2021 that a Flash officially died on the desktop. So maybe now when you hear the phrase, gone in a flash, it might not actually be referring to how your system was compromised. Which means, this week we talk with Ryan Lloyd from GuardSquare about the interesting threats that mobile apps face and how to harden those apps against modern attacks. In the news segment, chaos around a disclosure, details for chaos DB, busy box volumes from fuzzing, new attacks from HTML smuggling, and more. Don't mention Silverlight and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news, it's time for Application Security Weekly. Contrast Security enables organizations to secure their applications from development to production. By embedding security sensors within software, Contrast automatically and continuously detects vulnerabilities in both custom and open source code while developers write code, providing them with context-specific how-to-fix guidance for easy and fast remediation. At the same time, by identifying only true vulnerabilities that pose risk and eliminating those that do not, Contrast empowers developers and security teams to prioritize and focus on only those vulnerabilities that matter. Learn how Contrast can help you secure your applications from development through production at securityweekly.com forward slash contrast. Looking to improve your web application security? Probly is reinventing web application security. Probly focuses on the vulnerabilities that matter, eliminates false positives with evidence-based scanning, and provides a simple point-and-shoot solution that is easy to use. Probly's thorough coverage ensures accurate identification of vulnerabilities in any modern web application or API. Improve your web application security processes by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Probly and start your free trial today. This is episode 174, recorded November 15th, 2021. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella, a man who, instead of running a free browser plugins, runs a browser free of plugins. At least I hope so, John. Uh, it's pretty, well, it depends on which browser. One of them is pretty free. <laughs> the other has a lot of them. <laughs> All right, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and maybe we'll have a survey at the end to see which one he's talking about. Uh, in the meantime, please join us live or plan to join us for our next live webcast on December 2nd to see what's under the XDR hood. Visit securityweekly.com slash webcast to save your seat. And don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com slash on-demand. Ryan leads the product team at GuardSquare. In his role, he is responsible for overseeing the product vision and strategy. Prior to joining GuardSquare, Ryan held product management leadership roles at several developer-focused technology companies, including Faircode, SmartBear, and PTC. Hello, Ryan, and thank you for joining us. Hi, Mike. Great to see you. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here and also have uh, particularly happy because we often think of AppSec and go into the web application security route, which might also hit some APIs, which mobile applications clearly also have some web-based APIs on their back end. Uh, but mobile is pretty interesting. Mobile has some unique aspects to it. And uh, one of the things I'd love to just kick off is talk about, you know, what are some of those threats or why should we be calling? out or thinking about mobile application security you know, differently from web application security in terms of uh, building those threat models and, and worrying about what types of attacks might be coming down the road? Yeah. So, you know, even in my experience, I, I was focused on security initially from a web app perspective. But when I joined GuardSquare, it was, it was really interesting because um, you realize that, that things look a little bit different from the lens of, of mobile. And, and one of the key differences in the mobile app security space is that we're not just focused on uh, the man at the middle attack or server side vulnerabilities. Um, we have an application that's distributed through an app store and downloaded on end devices. And so what people can do when they're at the end with the device, with time and resources, 
uh, available to them, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty endless. They've got endless tools available and at their disposal to reverse engineer, manipulate uh, the applications on the mobile device for a whole variety of reasons. You know, different industries see different uh, manifestations of, of, of those threats, whether it's banking, gaming, uh, consumer tech. I mean, it seems like in the last 18 plus months, everything's gone mobile. Um, and that's actually what really inspired me to, to get into the mobile AppSec space was just we're at this tipping point, I think, where mobiles um, no longer can be overlooked because of some of those security threats. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that stands out to me is that, of course, we could maybe talk about APIs and uh, ho hopefully not though, talk about SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and those API backends. But the mobile aspect itself, a lot of the you know real-world threats and scenarios, some of which you're starting to allude to when you're you know uh, ticking off different industries, those vulnerabilities tend to start to crop up in the business workflows. Call it the that 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 business logic, um, to recall uh, what whichever version of the OWASP top ten that was in, uh, and you mentioned things like uh, like consumer tech, uh, buying purchase purchasing tickets right for concerts or even gaming. Lots of gaming. I think we've covered this a little bit on this past shows just around anti cheating mechanisms because like many you know many companies want to have good experiences with for their players and tamp down on cheating so i'm curious are there some help us fill out some of these threats and what they look like perhaps in in um uh, the, these various industries and what some of the things we'd have to for an uh, application security team start to keep in mind or make sure we keep in mind within our threat models yeah so i think i think historically banking financial services payment systems has been the primary focus of, of mobile application security, because I think the threat was obvious to everyone. It's payment data, it's, it's um, uh, exploiting users in an app. Uh, so that's all, I, I guess, obvious to everyone. But now we're getting to the second and third wave of uh, app developers that are realizing that there's, there's material threats that impact them. So let's take gaming. Gaming is a great example because um, you think about the incentives of someone uh, who might want to attack a game, it's the gamers themselves. Um, so it's it's not <laughs> some mysterious sort of um, agent actor who's trying to, uh, you know, attack the services. It's the gamer that you would normally sell to. Um, so it's actually kind of hard to discern the threat actor from from a legitimate user. And so in gaming, the the, the goal there is let's uh, let's decompile this app, let's figure out how it works, and then let's manipulate it. That could be to bypass uh, advertising in the game. It could be to acquire additional resources, whether it's coins or, uh, however the, the mechanics of that game work. Um, so gaming, those are, those are some examples and, and that impacts the app developer in a, in a really material way, because as soon as one person modifies or manipulates that game, um, they'll publish that online for thousands of others to, to consume. And it really erodes the trust in the game in a multiplayer game it means it's no longer fun. It's not competitive. Um, or in a, a game that's just more of a, a single user game that can bypass the whole monetization strategy of that, that game and impact the developer. Um, you mentioned ticketing. Ticketing is another great example. You know, people using uh, their understanding of your mobile application by reverse engineering it, by, by hooking it, uh, running it on a jailbroken device to, to figure out the inner workings of it so they can scale up um, the consumption and purchase of, uh, you know, limited tickets or, or events or uh, things of that nature. Um, and then maybe the last example I'll touch on is consumer consumer tech, because uh, it's it's got a bit of a different flavor to it. You know, we're seeing uh, in today's sort of world of, of media uh, hype and, and scrutiny, um, there's a lot of demand for um, leaking announcements and, and features that are coming in mm -hmm. the mainstream consumer tech that, that we see in our lives all the time. So you'll see a lot of folks targeting these mobile apps of these big consumer brands just to understand what their roadmap is, what's coming, uh, how to leak uh, those features and, and announcements that uh, have started to make their way into the applications because they have maybe a six-month or nine-month lead time to, uh, to develop.
Yeah, and those I, I like those examples because they bring up new and different, at least, uh, um, types of attack scenarios that I think don't get discussed too often, especially if we're just looking at technical top ten lists. Because you know you're describing more of uh, not quite reputational risks necessarily of of someone going in and reverse engineering you no know, particular new features coming out, but it means that the companies are losing control of a narrative around new features, and that can have consequences, of uh, financial consequences for them, um, as well as marketing. And, and so that that's why, like, these these different different creative ways that we need to think about mobile apps. So, and now we've been focusing quite a bit already on just setting the case for what, what these attacks are, why we should be worried, uh, but we should start doing something about it. Now, obviously, I've been mentioning threat modeling more than once uh, so far, but if we get beyond threat modeling and start to say, what should we do to harden our code? Or what are some of the things that the, what are those conversations now that the application security team should be having with DevOps to say, uh, you know, are we, are, are, how, how, how confident are we in the security of our mobile app? Or, you know, do we have a smiley face or a sad face when we're releasing it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think starting with the threat model is, is a smart way to go because the more you understand uh, the threat, the better you can think about the the systems, the controls that we're going to put in place to to mitigate that. Um, and and you know, teasing out some of these more nuanced examples of threat are are pretty important. Um, so from from our perspective, you know, there's the obvious uh, code reviews you need to do on your application. You know, that's going to help catch um, trivial errors like you know incorrect permissioning and and things like that. Um, ideally, companies are going to start to automate. Uh, the security testing for mobile. Um, that's obviously mm -hmm. quite mainstream on, on most development projects to do automated security testing. Um, mobile, however, has only recently started to have tool support um, that, that really is tailored to the unique uh, aspects of a mobile application because it does have a lot of differences from uh, a web application, both in terms of the technology and coverage. So automating security testing is, is important. Um, when we think about code hardening, uh, we often uh, kind of go hand in hand with um, obfuscation and uh, encryption techniques at the at the code level, and this is really to help protect against um, some of the obvious static analysis uh, techniques uh, that are out there. So I talk about the consumer tech and leaking features. Um, code obfuscation can help protect uh, the integrity of those those features and, and keep them not so vulnerable to to prying eyes, so to speak takes that, that low hanging fruit off the table. Um, and then you shift into maybe what kind of protections do we need to put in place around the app um, to kind of protect it from the environment it operates in? Because again, with the, the mobile apps, the, the unique uh, aspect here is that you've got someone at the end with that device who controls the device it's running on. So it might be a rooted device, might be plugged into a debugger, uh, they might be running the app, they might have extracted it from the app store. Uh, which is trivial to, to do, um, and running on an emulator. So uh, having some protections in place in your app and around your app to identify the environment uh, where it's operating is, is pretty crucial. Gaming is a great example of that. In, great, in gaming, um, you, know, you really want to be on the lookout for the environment it's being run in to detect when somebody might be trying to uh, manipulate that game with um, things that are looking at the memory um, and, and so forth. Yeah, and I think it, uh, this interesting about sort of that jailbroken aspect because it's not like you, you can't control whether or not it's it's a, a jailbroken device, nor even necessarily can you tri trivially detect it in all cases. So uh, you know, I think what you're you're leading to there is those discussions around what should we use as a signal for this? So I think, you know, as you were describing it, and maybe the the question is, how have you seen different companies react to rooted devices, jailbroken devices, et cetera, in the sense of not allowing the app to run at all versus just using that as an input signal. Perhaps that's a signal for fraud that if there is a rooted device or it's running in an emulator and uh, it's collecting and it's trying to buy, purchase a lot of tickets, that might be more evidence of bot activity rather than uh, call it an authentic authentic user. Um, this idea of inauthentic, inauthentic, if I can speak today, behavior versus authentic behavior. Uh, so, so that's one aspect, but that also seems 
that that's not something necessarily hardening code. That's actually writing new code to detect signals. So maybe if I do have a question in here somewhere, it's more around how have you seen developers approach the uh, coding aspect or, the, or, or maybe the detection of their environment around them and using that as a source of signals for this is fraudulent. We should be more worried here or for that matter, less worried here about the environment we're executing in. Yeah, so there's there's almost a there's a detection. There's what do you want to do about it, and and how can that be leveraged yeah. elsewhere in your your company, right? So the the detection part, um, it's it's not trivial. It's hard, um, uh, and it's constantly evolving as well. So the good news is there are lots of commercial products and, and vendors out there that provide uh, libraries, toolkits, and, and protection uh, software um, that can help detect. Uh, those those threats that are that are relevant um, emulators, rooted devices, jailbroken devices, um, you know, specific game uh, cheat uh, software that might be running on the on the device. Um, so you got to find a maybe a trusted vendor uh, and technologies to build upon. Um, some companies will try and invent and build that themselves, but it can be um, both costly up front and and also it's hard to keep pace with how that uh, landscape evolves so quickly. Uh, that's like keeping pace. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think I, I wanted to definitely um, uh, riff on that keeping pace aspect because one of the things you mentioned earlier was obfuscation. And now I know uh, the obfuscation was the intention to protect confidentiality of upcoming features, things like that, not necessarily as a strict boundary for the the integrity or the availability aspects of that CIA triad. And, you know, whenever you mention obfuscation or obscurity, it's sort of the here be dragons in terms of, is this a good control, a security control or not? But what you're describing there, I think, is the better way to think of it in the sense of it may be costly to implement anti-reverse engineering features, costly in, to implement, or you hope it's not too costly to implement obfuscation features, but there's a cost to your own developers, and ideally the cost to your attackers is that much higher. Um, so, you know, how do you, or how do AppSec teams, DevOps teams try to think about or try to even measure about this difficulty saying, here's the effort we're putting in to protect our app, and we hope and do, or do we have some better metrics or ideas around how much more difficult that's going to make it for attackers to actually do some reverse engineering or other types of analysis on our app? Yeah. So, you know, obfuscation, you know, some teams will look at it and think it's a, a dirty word and it's, you know, um, security through obscurity. Um, but, you know, to me, it's it's a layer of defense, right? So you think about a defense in depth strategy, it's going to have layers to it. Uh, and this is one layer that can help, uh, especially... Um, with the, the low hanging fruit, um, because the, the worst thing about um, mobile app security these days is that the bar just keeps getting lower and lower for people to uh, perform static analysis techniques and dynamic analysis techniques. So uh, it's it's a protective um, measure, you know, part of a layer. And you've got to be careful, though, on, on how you approach the problem, uh, because there are ways to, to simply uh, obfuscate uh, code. Um, and the challenge there is if you're using something uh, that's that's widely known um, and and can be broken once, uh, you can't rely on that any longer. So, you know, when we uh, think about implementing uh, solutions for for obfuscation and working with customers, it's all about um, two things: one, uh, polymorphism in how we approach it, uh, so that every release build of your application. Uh, the techniques and the way they're applied throughout your application look different. Um, so that means even if someone spent enough time, enough resources uh, to figure that out once, um, the next release you do, if you're on a, let's say, releasing every couple of weeks, every four weeks, uh, you're resetting the clock on them and just making it hard again. So if it takes them a lot of time uh, to reverse engineer your application, and every time you release, you kind of reset that clock, um, that can be pretty discouraging. There, there will be other unprotected applications that people will go after uh, first. So that's that's one way to look at it uh, in terms of the rule obfuscation plays. Yeah, so definitely that that idea of increasing that that work factor and and making hopefully that your your attacker's work factor is higher than your own. I, I want to circle back to a little bit of as we talk about hardening and on this the, the defensive aspect of things. Talked a little bit about. Um, 
uh, APIs and just with with things like APIs in mind, or a lot of uh, applications, mobile applications, may be built in code that has you know in, uh, memory safety issues. Uh, so suddenly we do have to think about buffer overflows, stack over uh, you know heap overflows, things that aren't as traditionally common within web applications. So if you did have to go down a list of here's a couple common things to look for separate from the obfuscation aspects uh, in just terms of code security, what, what might be a couple items on that short list that you'd want to make sure that the that your DevOps, your developers are are keeping in mind for their mobile side of things. Yeah, you know, I think the the OWASP mobile top ten provides a pretty good grounding on where to start and where to focus your efforts. Um, you can always go deeper beyond that, but uh, things like the security of communications between client and server, right? Making sure you're using good TLS and SSL between the mobile app and the server. Um, SSL pinning where applicable, um, but but all of those um, protection measures that you might put in place uh, need to be complemented with with other layers of security as well. Because um, looking at some examples from our security research team recently around SSL pinning and some um, you know really public visible examples of how to bypass SSL pinning in some of the most popular uh, apps out there. Um, so it's it's not just about using those secure communication mechanisms, but the the, the part we touched on earlier about uh, the runtime protections, the anti tampering sort of preventative measures, is all about making sure that there isn't another way to get around those protective measures you put in place. Uh, so uh, making sure you can't just um, take that communication when it's in memory, look at it uh, because sometimes even though the communication secure. Uh, if you can intercept it at a, at a point in time um, to just replay that that uh, mm -hmm. uh, mechanism, it doesn't matter how secure it is. So, um, yeah, there's lots of examples here where it, it's just about putting the, the layered approach. So insecure communication, anti-tampering measures, obfuscation of sensitive and, and uh, IP in your application. Um, and then beyond, beyond that, um, Data storage on the app is a, is a pervasive issue we continue to see. Um, and hard-coded credentials. Uh, you know, it's strange. You still see a lot of uh, hard-coded keys and credentials that make their way into to applications and, and aren't uh, protected, which kind of weakens the whole, the whole system. Yeah, that's the, the the long sigh of, oh, why do we still have these these simple flaws? And why aren't our tools being better about throwing up the, the red squiggly line under our code or at least <laughs> setting off some other klaxons and alarms about these uh, the, the, the programming basics, so to speak? Uh, one of the things that stood out to me, too, is that you're mentioning like, like hard-coded secrets, for example, and the idea of signed requests. I've seen, you know, anecdotally, I've seen some mobile applications begin to sign requests between client and server. Obviously, uh, on the client, it's possible to pull those secrets out, those signing keys uh, for to a, to a degree. So th th that's th there's a work factor there. But the reason I, put, I bring that up is that we've also seen in things like uh, Burp Suite, uh, lots of developer or lots of AppSec pen testers are starting to create some helpful plugins to capture and re-sign those types of requests just to make the the pen testing a bit easier because, and, and I guess I'm using that as one of those examples of just showing how it is an increase in work factor on attackers, but I suppose we still want some friendly pen testing, if you will, or of course, just call it bug bounty uh, testing of our applications. So how, how have you seen organizations uh, approach that balance between either pen testing their own apps or doing their own reverse engineering to figure out is this, you know, are these hardening steps we're taking good investments or, or how well are they working for us? Or are they maybe inhibiting the ability to find other more consequential vulns that, you know, uh, that, that we want the community that's uh, going to go down the disclosure process to find for us? Yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's no, there's no um, alternative to, you know, implementing testing early in your, your process and making people accountable for thinking about security early on. Um, but penetration testing is a great way to complement that, get an external point of view, uh, validate uh, your assumptions and, and, and design of your security because it's easy to be too close to it sometimes during the, the development process. Um, 
but beyond penetration testing, once your application's out there, it's in the real world, it's been downloaded in millions of devices, um, we're increasingly <clears throat> seeing a lot of value in more sort of monitoring your application in the wild. So we talked about sort of the, the benefits of runtime protection and sort of mm -hmm. detecting these uh, threats, um, um, you know, jailbroken devices, rude devices, and all these different signals. Um, bringing all those signals together and being able to identify when several of them are happening in concert can really give you a good indication of what the, the threat landscape looks like in the wild for your application and, and where you might need to kind of course correct or adjust some of your security posture of your, your application. And you talked about sort of the fraud element to that uh, as well, um, using those signals and, and those learnings to supplement even maybe some of your business uh, fraud um, scenarios. We see it in, in finance uh, where they'll want to um, correlate that with other uh, interesting signals and pieces of data for, for fraud detection. Uh, and we see it in gaming. You, if you see a concentration of users, uh, you know, of, a speci of specific characteristics um, performing a series of um, sort of threat uh items like running the app on a jailbroken device and an emulator and uh, in, in succession, um, you can use that to inform how you uh, ban users from, from using your game and kind of head off some of those anti-competitive um, cheats and, and modifications that go on. Yeah, so there's sort of the, oh, go ahead, John. Right, I'm just thinking about that. It, it's your, how would I say? The, I, I'm always, I think a lot of, um, how will I say, security consumer, security product consumers out there or, or um, operators um, are always uh, sensitive to how many of their agents or, you know, things like that they have to install to keep everything secure. Um, and this could go both ways. It's not so much a, a anti-product, it could be a pro-product thing. But how do you think, what you're talking about, sort of what you've been talking through there the last few minutes with, uh, um, you know, how do you sense some of those things? Um, it was making me think about APM, uh, application monitoring. Do you, do you see a parallel, parallel there, or do you think um, some of the security tools can actually provide some of that APM data, or am I sort of barking off on a, a wrong tree, or does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, we, we look at it, we, we see there's actually a lot of value in, in uh, maybe integrating some of that security tooling mm. with APM tools. So, in fact, you think about, you think about a mobile game, Nowhere in the mobile world is uh, are the stakes so high in terms of performance. So mm -hmm. you think about implementing security controls, security checks, obfuscation, you know, these things we've been talking about, they all come with trade-offs, right? Every, everything in security comes with, with trade-offs. Um, so we actually see a lot of value in um, using performance profiling in conjunction with these uh, security controls to kind of get that balance right what parts of an application and what not do we need to protect? What are the critical performance characteristics and how do we apply uh, these things in the right way? Um, but on the monitoring side, yeah, there might be um, more leverage to be explored uh, there as well. Yeah, and I think if I, I, I'm trying, while you two were talking, I'm trying to come up with a, a pithy way to, to summarize that aspect, but I, I'm going to have to be a little bit more verbose, surprise, but it, it sounds to me that there's a security aspect of the, the client is that, yes, there there's some basic uh, hygiene, we'll call it, just about hardening the, hardening the mobile client, but it's still the client and it's under control of the attacker. But what you two have just been describing is that there's also mobile security in terms of the client's behavior and that behavioral analysis or that that call it the, the metadata around what it's what it's doing whether it's something as simple as coming from a single ip address that's probably oversimplified in this day and age uh, but we've seen you know if you've seen uh, the uh, news in the last couple of years and looking at mobile fraud, you've possibly seen pictures of walls of physical hardware, you know, physical devices, physical handsets that are just farms and farms of doing this type of fraud. But it sounds to me that if those signals are coming from a group of IP addresses or they're targeting groups of accounts or they're tag or they're following very common sequences of events, those are signals that are going to be detectable uh, because that's how you have to use the mobile client. And it's not something necessarily that attackers, I think, can easily work around. So that sounds like a very rich area to consider in terms of mobile security that's actually off the device. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would agree. I think there's there's um, many different reasons to to look at it that way. You know, in the in the simplest examples, you can think about behavior analysis and uh, detecting bots and spoofing. Um, the hardest part with those kind of approaches, though, is sometimes you scale up uh, a particular modified application, and the illegitimate uh, use of an application may look very similar to the legitimate use of an application. <laughs> yes. But you know, there's there's good sophisticated techniques coming around app attestation and. Uh, verifying the authenticity of clients. Yeah, it's it's all about many different layers and security controls that are available to us as mobile app developers and security practitioners. Uh, it's about enriching our view and understanding to pick the right ones that, that make the most sense for us. Absolutely. I think uh, w- one of the things I'm happy about is that uh, I was able to use a mobile app to successfully purchase some tickets to see craft work in the future. So that's what I have to look forward to in a, in a couple months. Um, Ryan, in terms of uh, where your mind is at, maybe a bit more along the lines of mobile security, uh, what, what what do you see in the next couple months as something to for either teams to consider, think about adding to the part of their SDLC practices, or just something that you're excited about in terms of mobile security? For me, the, there's there's two things that I'm really excited about. One is more mainstream concern and adoption of the fundamental sort of mobile security practices. I think there's still so much room and potential for us to get that right. Um, but in parallel to that, uh, I'm also intrigued by the advanced customers we have, the, the most sophisticated organizations that are not just looking at sort of the mainstream fundamental practices, but they're looking at some really complex, hard edge cases um, that will probably be the mainstream in the future. So for us, it's the duality of um, supporting the mainstream audience today with the basics of security testing, uh, code hardening, runtime protection, threat monitoring, while also exploring some of those new, more um, under-researched areas that uh, will be the future threat. Very cool. Well, thank you for bringing those messages to our audience. And uh, we'll definitely have to see what those perhaps underappreciated threats are in another couple months and uh, find out what you've been seeing and what kind of uh, advice you can bring to us. So thank you. Sounds great. Thanks. Also want to thank John and thank everyone who is hanging out in Discord or listening to us live. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about GuardSquare, visit securityweekly.com slash GuardSquare. With that, we're going to take a quick break and return with News of the Week. <laughs> 